this over here. This morning is Pentecost Sunday in the church year, and I'm not preaching on Pentecost per se, um, but this is the Sunday that the church remembers the sending of the Holy Spirit, which is recorded in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2, and Jesus promised it in the Gospels as well. And uh, in fact, he told the disciples, we read in the first part of Acts, to wait in Jerusalem until they receive power from God, from power from on high from God. And so the early church after Jesus' ascension into heaven is gathered in a second-story room, the upper room, as was called uh, in English translation. And um, they were in this upper room, and they were praying and waiting on God. Before they did anything, before they shared the mission of the kingdom, before they talked about Jesus to others, they waited uh, for this power that Jesus said, you need to wait until you receive the Holy Spirit. And so Acts records that they were waiting in that upper room on Pentecost, and it says that as they were praying, suddenly the, as something as a sound as a mighty or a rushing or a violent wind filled the room. If you can imagine the sound just of a, of a cyclone or a hurricane wind or, or, a, or a monsoon rainstorm, that sort of whooshing sound filled the room, it's recorded. And it appeared as if fire was sitting on each person's head. <laughs> imagine this, uh, this scenario. And, and they began to speak in other languages, it tells us, as the Holy Spirit gave them the ability to do so. Languages that they had not learned, but were other languages from around the world. And during this, this Jewish festival of Pentecost, when this happened, there would have been men and women from all over the world in Jerusalem, both Jews and God-fearers and other merchants that would have been there uh, of different languages from the known world at the time. And they heard people praying and worshiping and exalting God and Jesus in their languages from these men and women in the upper room who would not have known these languages, a miraculous gift of speaking and knowing languages and uh, other languages. And, and as this happens, the church, these folks are empowered and they leave that experience sharing the good news of Jesus. In fact, Acts goes on and tells us that Peter goes out and the people around this upper room are like, what is this chaos and and sort of this cacophony of noise? I just wanted to work the word cacophony into a sentence today, so there it is. This multi, many different noises coming together, cacophony of noise. And and they said, these men must be drunk. And, And Peter, one of the apostles who was up there in the upper room and experienced this himself, said, no, these men are not drunk. But it is 9 a.m. in the morning. He said, this is what God promised to, uh, within the prophet Joel within Israel. He said, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And it says this, that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Everybody will speak empowered speech of the Lord, prophecy. It says, your young men will see vision. Your old men will dream dreams. And it says, even on uh, my manservants and maidservants, meaning all social economic class, all peoples, I will pour out my spirit, says the Lord. And Peter said, this was promised at Jesus' ascension. And he said, not only is it for us in this immediate context 2,000 years ago, but for all who are afar off. Meaning every generation, every ethnic group, every ethnos, every nation, every nation, everybody from this point all the way until Jesus one day literally and visibly comes again. And we live in this period of the outpouring of God's spirit and his grace. And so this Sunday, almost all Christian churches acknowledge in one way or the other the birth of the church. And that is when the church was birthed. Peter goes on in this message in Acts chapter 2 and he preaches and it tells us that thousands became Christians that day, followers of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus, that God has come down in the flesh, dwelt among us, had to pick a specific time and people in place because if he's going to come down and put on flesh, you got to do that. And he said, and, and completes the story of ancient Israel and calls all of us to be added into that story or grafted into that story. And that all of us have access to this other kingdom where Jesus is king And it's not run by bullets or boundaries or borders or bombs or ballots. It's run by his lordship out of love. And so we have the choice to enter into the story of Jesus. So this Pentecost, before we read the text, I'm preaching a sermon before my sermon. I apologize. Maureen is never going to skip out on this job again. Uh, (laughs) We all have access to that. And this Pentecost... My challenge to you is if you're curious about Jesus, it's because his spirit is at work in your life. Even if you don't use any of that language yet, or maybe you're using another religious uh, language, but I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit is drawing you and calling you to have a relationship with God that's personal and real through Jesus and the power of his spirit who's present 
in the church and in the world around us. And so maybe this is your day to say, Jesus, I pledge allegiance to your kingdom first and all other loyalties secondarily. Maybe this is your Sunday. I don't know, but God knows and, and you might know. So don't leave today without doing business with the Lord. Uh, you can do that at the end of the service with one of our elders or pray with them if you want, um, but I encourage you to do that. All right, so we're going to read the gospel together. Let's look to Luke 15 this morning as we begin this summer series. If you have a Bible, grab it or grab the Pew Bible in front of you. It's the blue book. I think some of them are red, but most of them are blue. And we're going to turn to the gospel of Luke. So I encourage you to read with me both in the Bible and on the screen or just listen if you want. But it's important that you hear the word and uh, let it soak in. Luke is in the New Testament, which if it's a full Bible, it's the last third of the Bible, roughly. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, you'll find it in the first four books of the last third of the Bible. Uh, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to look at Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. Everyone's so quiet. I know we're in summer mode, and everyone's kind of like, oh, it's summer, and it's getting hot, and all of this. But are, are you awake this morning? Okay, okay all right. When we gather in the church, Jesus said that even if two or three are there, he will be uniquely present when we gather face to face, whether in small groups where the chairs are turned towards each other or in Sunday gatherings where they're turned towards um, teaching and worship together. He's here in a unique way. That electricity you may feel here and there is not just goosebumps. Well, it may be that too from the pizza last night, but it can also be the Holy Spirit. God moving in this place. So enter into it with us this morning. So let's read this. You can follow along, and I'm going to read it out loud. Then Jesus, verse 11, said, A man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that will belong to me after dad dies, but give it to me now. So the father divided his assets between the sons. After a few days, the younger son gathered together all he had and left on a journey to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth with a wild lifestyle. And then after he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and worked for one of the citizens of that country who sent him to feed his pigs in the field. And he was longing to eat the carob pods that the pigs were eating but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, I love that. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have food enough to spare? But here I am dying from hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired workers. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long ways off from home, his father saw him and his heart went out to him and his father ran and hugged his son and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the slaves, hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. No vegans were these folks. Let us eat and celebrate because this son of mine was dead and is alive again and he was lost and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, hang on, there's a little more to this story. Now the older son, the older son was in the field and as he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the slaves and asked, what's going on? What's happening? And the slave replied, your brother has returned and your father has killed the fattened calf because he got his son back safe and sound. But the older son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and appealed to him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have worked like a slave for you. I have never disobeyed your commands. And you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when his son of yours came back, when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Then the father said to him, son, 
You are always with me, and everything that belongs to me is yours. It was appropriate to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, let's pray. God, uh, you've been moving today in this place, in spite of us, sometimes our lack of faith, sometimes our weariness, sometimes our distractedness. For some of us here, though, this may be one of the most important days ever in their life because it may be for someone the day that they begin to pledge allegiance and walk after you and lean into your story. And so, God, I know that for someone today, this may be a pivotal Sunday. And may myself, who has heard the story a thousand times and preached hundreds and hundreds of sermons, and all those who are gathered here this morning, may I not fail in the task you have assigned me today. For I am a saint and sinner in process. Thank you that I am in process by the power of your spirit. So move, Lord, through the preaching of your word, through topics, through the text Do what only you can do and bring life to those that are lost, freedom to those that are bound, hope to those that are without hope. In Jesus' name we pray. And if you will say amen, Amen. please be seated in the presence of the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be okay. That was really good for Pilgrim. Can we do it again? Look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be okay. (laughs) Or your other neighbor, (laughs) it's going to be okay. This Sunday and throughout summer, we're going to be going through a series on the basics of Christianity or building blocks of the faith. And for many of us, this is going to be review, but for some of us, this is going to be new stuff. I'm using as a main resource, Palmer Becker's Begin Again, or Begin Again Renew, And we'll be going off on various tangents uh, and building on that as well. As we read this story this morning, this first message that I want to talk about is believing in God. Believing in God and what is your picture of God? Because everyone has a picture of God or feelings about God or an image that you're reacting against about what God or the divine or as one theologian said the ground of being that everything else is sustained by in the universe you have some picture of God we're going to preach a little bit each Sunday in this series both preach and teach preaching is more about proclaiming the story of Jesus and calling you to enter into it or to continue into it if you're a believer And teaching is more about sort of getting into the weeds a little bit. And uh, so we're going to do a little bit of both in this series. This passage that we read this morning, it's interesting. Fred Craddock, an old uh, dead now uh, commentator and pastor, said this, that there are two elements that tend to get neglected in Luke 15 in the story of the prodigal son. And these elements are the party, the Judaism and Christianity both have clear provisions for restoring the repentant person as most the first listeners would have all been in the Jewish context uh, of this story. And then as the gospel went out, uh, it expanded. But here there is a party involved. There's a party involved. I say this in the midst of a Baptist land here. I just want to hear from Fred Craddock, who I believe was Christian Church Disciples of Christ. He said there's a party involved in the work of the kingdom. That Luke 15 talks about celebration and everything. In fact, there, there's three parables and they all end with a party of celebrating. When we gather and worship with people receiving Christ, questioning Christ, or celebrating their saveness, there should always be an element of party about believers. I could just preach a whole sermon on joy this morning, that there is joy that we can have access to regardless of our circumstances because of what God is doing by His Spirit, manifesting the kingdom of Jesus Christ on earth, even now, anticipating what's going to come fully one day. There is an element of party and what it means to be a Christian. And everyone said... Not inviting you all to the party, I tell you what. No, (laughs) just kidding. And everyone said yes or amen or so be it. There's a party involved, Fred Craddock says. He said the other thing that we tend to neglect is that the father loved two sons. 
Note that he didn't just go out when the young son returned from oh, far off. The father runs out to him, which would have been way below his dignity as a Middle Eastern patriarch of a family, probably dressed in robes and, and all of his garments for the day. And, and to, for him to run out, that is a completely upside down view of propriety and what would have been proper in face. You don't run out like that. He the son comes to him, not him running out. But he says, well, the young son was still a far way off. The father runs out to him. Pause. What's your picture of God this morning, beloved of the Lord? What's your picture of God? I know I'm a bit worked up. It's only one third calf, I might add. But there is a God the Father that is pursuing you. Even while you are far off, He desires that there is reconciled relationship between you and the Creator. What's your picture of God this morning, people? What's your picture of God? Is he a God who pursues the person who is trying to make their way back that doesn't even know the fullness of his grace? What is your picture of God? Or is your God a, a taskmaster? Is he heavy-handed? Is he brutal? Is, and I, is he, she, it, whatever? I mean, is your picture of God a God that's just ready to just lay the smack down? Oh, sinner, I'm here to smash you down and tell you what an awful wonder worm you are. That was an awful old hymn that talked about us being worms. <laughs> but when I read Genesis, it says that we were created male and female. We were created in the image and likeness of God. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That while we were afar off, the Father runs and pursues the Son. Oh, that preaches. Somebody should preach that. It's good. <laughs> but there were two sons. And he was not only generous with the younger son, he was generous with the older son. In fact, the text also says the father went out after the elder son as well. For those of you that are driven by duty, that are upset if the church talks too much about God's grace and God's love. For those of you that, that say, but I've been here serving the house all of my life. How dare they say, let's fling wide the gates of the kingdom. And you're arguing with the Father in your heart and in your mind and your emotions. In fact, you've distanced yourself from the Father. The Father didn't distance himself from you. You distanced yourself from the Father through judgmentalism, through forgetting what James 5.13 says, for mercy triumphs over judgment. But those that are not merciful shall receive no mercy. And here the older son is distancing himself from the Father. But the parable tells us that the Father went out after the older son son too. What's your picture of God? What's your picture of God, beloved? Look at your neighbor and ask them, what's your picture of God? So I know you're awake. Oliver Bays, what's your picture of God? Ask Mark that question. What's your picture of God this morning? Finally, the young son comes to his senses. I will arise and go to my father's house. The older son had a prodigal heart. The younger had a prodigal body and heart. Both of them become estranged from the father. And the father gives them freedom to become estranged. That tells us something else about our picture of God. God gives us freedom because love cannot be forced or compelled. What's your picture of God? Hang with me. We'll get to the list here in a second. List people in the outline. Rejoice. We're almost to the list, okay? It's going to be all right. We can fill in the blanks. I even left you blanks this morning to fill in. Rejoice and be glad, O list people, for I am with you, says the Lord. <laughs> Everyone, every... uh, no, I'll just keep moving. Keep moving. The Holy Spirit says keep moving. All right. <laughs> It does matter what you believe about God. You believe something about God. You have beliefs and a worldview that is shaped. For people of faith, for spiritual people, there is a shared belief that the world is a place of spirit and matter together. And that the matter is not self-sustaining, but something else is at work in the world. In fact, Christians would go as far, and we'll talk more about this next week, to say that in the whole of cosmos all that is material is sustained by god's gracious presence by his spirit in christ all things are held together 
This Bible is a recording of many books. But it's, we call it a Bible, but it's not one book. It's 66 books in the Protestant canon and a few more if you're Catholic and a few more if you're Eastern Orthodox. But uh, the, the New Testament books are considered sort of the peak of the Bible and the Gospels are the peak of the peak. And, and it's all authoritative in, in, in various ways. And as you learn the Bible, you'll learn how these parts fit together. Uh, but they're different books and they're all about people recording their encounters with God, the divine revelation of God through the, the patterns of normal life. And so our goal in this first part of the series is that you begin to clarify a picture of God. What is your picture of God? Second Samuel chapter seven, verse 22 says this, how great are you sovereign Lord? There is none like you and there is no God but you. And we have heard this with our own ears. Many people find it difficult to embrace a concept of God because their concept of God is too small or it's been warped too much. Oftentimes, if you've been raised in a religious background, your early picture of God was whatever that was, whether it was within certain strains of Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, Sikhism, all these different... Like, what you experience as a child, if you're raised religious, it kind of shapes your image of God. And if that goes unexamined, that can cause a, a big problem in your growth as a spiritual person. If an unbeliever critically challenges us sometimes on our particular belief of God, we might say... Can you describe to me your concept of God? I have found in conversations with atheist family members and others that some of their concepts of God, I don't believe in either. If that's their image of God, then I'm an atheist, according to that definition. I'm not an atheist, but I'm saying sometimes our image of God that we're reacting against needs to be reinformed or changed. So we need to examine some of these negative concepts of God. Let's just, I talked about them a little bit, but let me just list five real quick here. Are you still with me? Say yes. Number one, the internal enforcer, an internal enforcer. For many people, God is this restrictive force rather than a nurturing one. God is like an enforcement officer who's out to get them. He's the God that's ready to drop the hammer down. And they've been raised with this picture of God within, could be within Christianity, could be within any, uh, many other religious systems. But this restrictive consciousness is how they experience God. This God often can be developed during childhood, sort of when the, sort of the toddler phase of God, like don't touch the stove, you're going to get burned. And as a parent, if the toddler is reaching their hand out, you physically engage and get their hand out of the way before they touch the stove. If you're a good parent, if you're a bad parent, well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> but this concept of God, that's all God is, is he's stopping my hand from touching the stove. And although we no longer see the stove, so we just think God's restricting us, this restrictive view. Sort of related to that is the parental holdover God, number two in the outline, parental holdover. Early concepts of God built on how we experienced our fathers and mothers. If we had good parents, this helps us tend to develop a positive concept of God. If our parents were distant or abusive or too demanding, we tend to have a resentful or fearful attitude towards God. The third one here is the bearded elder, the bearded elder. God is beyond being masculine or feminine. But the scriptures and scriptures repeatedly refer to God as father, but sometimes as mother as well, feminine qualities of God. But sometimes we begin to naturally think of God because of some of these images as some grand old man. God is not some wizened Confucian elder or white guy sitting in the sky. Did I tell you my story of running into David Suzuki? He's not an older version of David Suzuki with his beard and his mane sitting in the sky. This is not God. <laughs> Or the Zeus-like Greek mythological figure, a bearded elder. What are some other wrong views of God or, or views that tend to get us off track? A withdrawn or distant creator, the deist. Thomas Jefferson was a great deist, a god that wound up the clock and threw it out into the universe and just lets the clock wind itself, play itself out. Deist. Well, yeah, there was this initiation and then God just like hands off, totally out of the picture. Some of you are like that with church. Okay, but that's another issue. Fifth, a violent, unpredictable force. Some people hold God responsible for storms or earthquakes. Insurance companies used to, maybe they still do, call these acts of God. Whenever there's something difficult or unanswerable, we appeal to mystery and call it God. Maybe that's your picture of God. All of these are not, I should say, are not life-giving pictures of God and certainly not the God revealed in Jesus. So let's keep going on this morning to the second part of this series on believing in God. 
I'm going to take a drink of my coffee. You all can watch me or you can look at your neighbor. How do you know God exists? In Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, the prophet says this, Come now, let us reason together. No one has seen God, we know this. No one has proved the existence of God with absolute certainty. Now, let me pause and say there are some apologists who will say, well, we can absolutely know X, Y, or Z. Well, this is not actually how the Bible approaches this knowledge of God peace. By faith and by revelation, we make our claim about God's existence. But that faith is not without evidence, for sure. We can know truth through reason and revelation. Through reason, you can kind of, you can get your point to understanding that God must exist, that there must be something that's sustaining all, that in terms of probability and relationship to all that is, the chance that there's a planet with life on it, and you begin, in fact, astrophysicists sometimes become believers in their attempt to sort of stay away from belief, because when they look at the probability, they say there has to be a mover behind it, there has to be a ground of being, there has to be something Uh, an intelligence behind this. Otherwise, there is no chance or almost no chance this could exist. You can reason your way to God in some ways. In Revelation, we talk about this idea of God communicating through experience and relationship by the Spirit. But again, I want to be careful. Ways that you know God is that God will never force you to believe. Because once an almighty powerful being forces you to believe, you're no longer a free agent. You are just an extension of that being. I know that's a big philosophical thing there. God doesn't force belief on anyone. He wants relationship. Relationship requires faith. I've used the example of the computer chip. If I could stick a computer chip in my wife's brain so she said everything I wanted her to say to me, did everything I wanted her to do, smiled at me when I wanted her to smile, did everything, and she didn't know that chip was in her brain, there's a sense in which, yeah, we have a relationship, but I always know that that chip is there, so she's really just an extension of me. Versus it being a mutual relationship where we grow together, we make mistakes, we move forward. That's the kind of relationship God wants. You are not a puppet. You are not an emanation of God's foreknowledge. You are not simply an extension of God's own being. He created outside of God's self. And in order to do that, he has to never coerce you to believe. He never, once he forces you, once he says, you must believe, you will, then it's over, game over. But he allows this freedom So let's look quickly at a few things of how do we know, how do we know God? Are you guys still with me? So quiet this morning. I I feel like this is simple stuff. It's not hard stuff. Yes? Okay. I mean, I love you. I'm for you. I mean, I wouldn't do this, put, put myself on exhibit if I wasn't for you. So, okay. How do you know God exists? There's just some, some real simple ways that we talk about experiencing God. Knowing God through nature, number one. Would you say it with me out loud, through nature? Through nature. The heavens tell the glory of God, Psalm 19. The skies display his marvelous craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. This anthropomorphization of creation. They continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is silent in the skies, and yet they speak. Romans 1.20 says this, From the time the world was created... People have seen through earth and sky and all that God has made, and they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing about God. So number one, there's this sense that nature itself sort of reveals the divine, and that in our experience of wilderness and solitude, we can come to be aware that there is something beyond, something that imaginatively brought this about. The second way that we can know God is through moral laws. Deuteronomy 6.18 says this, Do what is right and good in the Lord's sight that it may go well with you. There is a sense of justice that seems to be hardwired into us. There is a sense that some things in every culture and time are right and wrong. There is this sense of natural law woven into the universe. And some apologists would spend much time talking about this as also evidence that there might be a creator. Why would we have these similar things? Not simply through evolution, but because some things don't make sense that way. But that he has moved and caused us to see in right and wrong, in the sense of justice, the sense of being wrong, that there is something greater at play. If we obey some natural laws, we receive benefits. If we disobey them and violate them, we experience pain and disaster in society. I'm going to move on for sake of time. Number three, we can know God through inner experience. 
that within us is a faculty of understanding, this imagination, this as I talk about art and play and sport, that there's something about that that points to the divine and the spirit of God. Paul in Acts 17 says this, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious. He's standing on Mars Hill and he says, For I was walking along your many altars and one of them had an inscription to the unknown God. You've been worshiping him without knowing who he is. Now I want to tell you about him. In all cultures, in all times, in all places, humans have talked to God in prayer and have felt near to the sense of God. Think about that. Think about that. And all of our scientific advancements and technological advancements, we still deal with the same old brokenness and sin. We just magnify it with our technology and blessedness as well. Why is that? We know God through inner experience as well. Number three, that there is this yearning, this mystical desire is placed within us. There's a desire within us that has been placed in order to have a relationship with the creator. Why does that desire exist? We would say it is one of these thumbprints or one of these signs that God is using to lead us to seek after God. Four, five, and six. Knowing God through the supernatural. Say with me, the supernatural. Now, because I was saved in a Pentecostal church, I have a love-hate relationship with this. We believed in the manifest presence of God through signs and wonders, through personal inner experience, and certainly through signs and wonders. There are stories of people who have been healed People who have experienced a divine like wisdom or word for someone that they didn't know what was going on in their life and God gives them this thing and they say it and because of that, it leads them to pursue Jesus and to become Christians, these supernatural experiences. John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, talked about this idea of being naturally supernatural and what he called power evangelism. I don't like that. That's way too... Even for me, I'm from the U.S. Please forgive me, those of you that are struggling with that, particularly tomorrow if the um, Raptors don't win. But anyway, uh, (laughs) power evangelism. But this sense of there are times when a believer in tune with the Holy Spirit will speak something that is so dead on target into someone else's life, maybe a friend, maybe a neighbor, maybe someone they don't know, but they certainly didn't know this information on their own. And the Lord uses that to move them a step forward in their faith. And they ask the next question. Perhaps there is a God who cares for me. Perhaps there is more to this Christianity stuff. Five and six quickly. Knowing God through divine communication. The writers of scripture say over 300 times, the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord. So we read the Bible because it reveals some of these revelations and and records them both pre-Jesus and after Jesus. The word of the Lord came. A sense of experience of God, again, divine communication, where God drops something into their spirit. Now, we test that. We test it as as Christians with everything that's gone before. But the sense of divine communication. And then six, knowing God through Jesus. Knowing God through Jesus. I'm I'm almost done. Everyone said amen. Uh, Knowing God through Jesus. We'll talk more about Jesus next Sunday. But Jesus is history's unique God-man, God-man who bridges the gap between the human and the divine. The divine word, the will of God, becomes flesh and becomes personal in Jesus. And you can come to experience and know God most clearly through a relationship with Jesus, his life and teachings, the gospel in the New Testament, the power of the Holy Spirit in the church. God can become incarnate, it becomes incarnate when, and revealed in the character and acts of people who follow Jesus. As Christians follow Jesus in the church and don't give up on gathering together, the Spirit of God makes Jesus real in the body, each local church. Spirit is present, makes Jesus real. You can come to know God as you see his nature and will reflect it through people who are like Christ. Some of you need to take the fish off the back of your car. Some of, oh, okay, that's fair. Uh, But Jesus, this fullest revelation. There's more that we can say about God. And I'll just give you these things in the list here. But there's attributes of God. And we'll pick up with that next week uh, in the outline and talk more about Jesus. But this initial piece of believing God, this initial piece of, there are reasons people believe in the divine. There are reasons why we lean into it. There are Many pointers and indicators. 
But I think it's important to remember that God does not force you to believe. In fact, I think that's so important. I'm going to ask you, and it may irritate you. If you don't want to play, don't play. But say it with me. God will not force me to believe. Now, there is an exception to that. (laughs) And we confessed it in the creed this morning. One day, Jesus will return visibly and literally. And heaven and earth, however they're constituted, will become one. There will be new heavens and new earth made of the old and the new brought together. Revelation 21 speaks of this. And at that point, you won't be forced to believe. You'll still be given a choice. You will still have unique identity outside of God. You're not going to be absorbed into God's self like Brahmin. That doesn't happen. But there you will have... You will believe it's whether or not you will love becomes the final decision. In fact, Jesus said even the demons believe. It's a question of whether you're in a love relationship with God, that you want to be in a family relationship with God. And this comes back to sort of the picture of the prodigal son and the older son. The older son and the prodigal, both hearts were far from the father. And the father pursues them, but he does not force the reconciliation. The older son was in the house the whole time, but he had a prodigal heart towards the father. I leave you with this. What picture of God needs to be challenged? What picture will you land on? What picture will you land on? You have a choice. He's pursuing you this day. Believe in God. Stand with me this morning. Let's pray as we leave. There are some attributes of God, and we'll pick that up next Sunday. But I thought it was important to go with the flow, with the parable today. We are here as a church in part to testify that there is a God And that Jesus has come and put on flesh. And maybe you're here today and you've had that sense of God pursuing you. And you want to write it off and you're using every excuse in the book. And there's all kinds of things. We can always make reasons to deny some of these promptings. But they keep coming and they come in different ways. And God's not going to compel you into relationship, but he does invite you. Will you return home? Maybe you never knew you had a home that you are called to return to. The Father says, welcome home this morning. Welcome home. Maybe you only thought you had family of origin, family of adoption or ethnicity, but you also have a spiritual family. And the Father of us all is calling you and saying, come home, welcome home. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for your presence in this place. And God, in the busy distractedness of this world, it's hard for us to discipline ourselves to be still enough to listen to your spirit. And so, God, we do that in this moment. And we know that you're shaping something within us to make us more alive as humans, to flourish, to be better at what does it mean to love and to care. For our world fails to teach us that well. So, Lord, today I pray for all of us that we would lean into what does it mean to believe. There are reasons we can believe. And there's revelation as well. Stretch our categories of knowledge and truth to be as big as the universe that you have made and the signposts you have left us and the relationship you desire us to engage with with you. May this be a place for questioning with freedom and becoming faithful followers of Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.